So my name is Ellen Otterbein and I work uh, at Cambridge Hospital in infection prevention and control. So I'm one of two infection control professionals that, uh, that are here uh, Monday to Friday. One of us is always on call though, so that's something um, for you to know. Um, if, if something ever came up, if something happened and you wanted to ask a question or you were concerned and you wanted to connect with one of us for some reason, know that you can always reach us either through Switchboard um, or through Jamie or Linda. Okay, so uh, the training that we're covering today really is a review. I know some of you have been here for quite a long time, which is amazing, let me just say. Um, and I uh, just want to make sure that these um, principles and practices that we're going to talk about are fresh for you, okay? Um, we are in uh, a different world, so to speak, when it comes to infectious diseases um, than we were not so very long ago. Um, with travel and uh, the fact that you can go halfway around the world in you know, uh, a day or two and uh, be exposed to things in other countries and uh, very exotic places, and then you can come back just as quickly, um, increases risk. Although you might find yourself in a place of saying, but really, what is the risk? Is someone with Ebola actually going to come to Cambridge Hospital? And we can actually say probably not. However, when you say, no, that can't happen, the inevitable always happens, which is someone will actually come through and maybe have Ebola. So not specific to Ebola, but really um, to think about any infectious agent. So influenza is much more common than Ebola, much, much, much more common than Ebola. And we really need to th be thinking about influenza or about things like meningitis or things like tuberculosis or other infectious diseases that we could easily see. And we in fact do see um, every now and then coming through eMERGE, all right? So these are things that we want to uh, um, really keep in mind, all right? So we're here to promote and preserve your health and safety. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is the chain of transmission. The chain of transmission is probably familiar to you. I'm sure this isn't the first time that you've heard about it. Um, in, in the model form, it looks like this up in the top corner of the slide. But in real life, this is how it looks. So this fellow is a reservoir for an infectious agent. He might be sick with it. He might just have it in his respiratory tract. Either way, it can spread, okay? So even if I'm not feeling well, if I suddenly have a, a coughing attack, maybe I have asthma or some kind of lung condition that causes me to have spells of coughing and that kind of thing, even if I'm not sick with something, germs could still come out of me in the droplets that I create as I cough, all right? So even if I'm feeling well, I don't really want to see this situation happening and I don't want to put myself in this person's shoes and I don't want to be that person, okay? So he's our reservoir. You can see his portals of exit, okay? The infectious agent will be contained within the droplets. We also call those droplets the mode of transmission. Then we have her portals of entry. And of course, they're all very much exposed. And she is the new susceptible host. So if he had influenza, as an example, she could now be infected because she's had a direct exposure to this gentleman. What could have happened to prevent this? Mask on. He could have put a mask on. Absolutely. So he could have used your services as a volunteer when you came along and said, oh, you're coughing. Here, put on a mask. Right? Absolutely. So that's a good one. So he could have contained those droplets. Is there a way without a mask he could have contained the droplets? It's just done to the side of them. Okay. So we could have made a spatial um, difference. We could have said, instead of standing right in front of you, I'm gonna to stand to the side. So you're here and I'm here, and if you happen to cough, it's going to not hit me directly. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great. What else could he have done? He could have put on a mask if he was here, but yeah, he could have absolutely covered his cough, and most of those droplets would have gone into his arm and really been a non-issue. What could she have done? 
could she have done? We said she could have moved, mm -hmm. so she wasn't right in front of him, so that's good. Oh, she could have gone like this, yeah. That's an option, but that doesn't present a very friendly view. So, uh, she could have, sorry? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, what could she have done? She could have stayed back, absolutely. So that is entirely an option to say, you stay right there and I'll stay right here. And maybe instead of leading you to where you need to go, I'm going to provide direction. Follow the blue line down the hall and turn left or whatever that looked like. What else could she have done? She could have a mask. She could have a mask on. Now, would a mask on its own be enough to protect her? It would protect her mouth and nose. The eye shield. What about her eyes? Absolutely. So um, if you're thinking, hmm, body fluids or some kind of uh, fluid is going to splash or spray in my face because that person is coughing, don't just think about your nose and your mouth, but get one of those special masks that has an, uh, a visor on it. So the patient that you're working with doesn't have to have eye protection, okay, unless you're coughing on them. But most of the time, you're not going to cough on them. They will just need a regular mask. But as a, a, somebody in a role with the hospital, as a volunteer, is a perfect example, they're going to want to protect themselves with a mask and eye protection. And regular glasses aren't protective. It's not the 70s anymore. Glasses aren't as big as our face. And we have to always remember that even if we have prescription eyeglasses, they're not safety glasses, okay? So she could have put on a mask with eye protection, and of course, after this kind of situation, she's going to clean her hands, right? Okay, excellent. So everything that we do in infection control is about breaking at least one link in the chain of transmission. That's all we have to do to stop an infection from moving from one person to another. That's why we talk so much about hand hygiene, because hand hygiene breaks the train of transmission at the reservoir link, at the portal of exit link, at the mode of transmission link, and at the portal of entry link. Oh, wow. I love that. So if I just talk and talk and talk about hand hygiene, you're going to be able to do a lot just by keeping your hands clean. And I think you're all well aware of that. I know many of you have been around uh, for, for a number of years and you've probably seen a progression. Not so very long ago, we didn't really have alcohol-based hand rub in this hospital or in any hospital. And now you really can't go anywhere without having a dispenser close by. So um, know that hand hygiene, as simple and easy as it seems, really is one of the best things we can do to prevent and control the spread of infections. Respiratory etiquette, coughing in the sleeve, another good thing that's going to prevent the spread of infections. Uh, what about using a tissue? Is that illegal now? No, you can use a tissue, but after you use a tissue or after someone uses a tissue, you should clean your hands, right? It's simple. Environmental cleaning, so, so, so important. And I know part of what you do as volunteers is sometimes take a gloved hand and a wipe and wipe surfaces down. And that is a huge benefit to health and well-being of people sitting in those chairs, whether it's in a waiting area or wherever. That's a really important part of what you do to prevent and control the spread of infections. Spatial separation, as we identified in the previous slide, is something to consider. So if someone walks in and they really don't look good, keeping as much distance as you can from them okay, is, is going to be a, a good way for you to preserve your health. And uh, using personal protective equipment, okay, so we have masks with eye protection available. Make sure that you know where they're located and where you can get one in case you need it, all right? And always then be thinking, and, and we'll actually talk more about that in a minute, about when it might be necessary to use the personal protective equipment. Any questions so far? Okay, routine practices are recommended by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So I didn't just make this up. Um, we use them for everybody all the time because you never know who could have something. They have their foundation in universal precautions. Many people understand universal precautions and um, that's a really old term. In Canada, since 1999, we've called the universal precautions 
routine practices. So for our purposes today, the routine practices are risk assessment, hand hygiene, and access to personal protective equipment. And we're going to think about routine practices as a toolbox. Okay, so we're, we're going to think about um, maybe our previous lives when we um, had jobs or we were engaged in, in the workforce um, as, as staff people. And uh, we're going to think about specific jobs like uh, mechanics or carpenters or plumbers who carry a toolbox around. Why do those people carry a toolbox? When they need uh, something, it's right there. Right, yeah. sure. So they know what's in it yeah. and they know, you know, you never know what you might need. So you carry your toolbox and you have everything at your disposable, at your disposal rather, as you need it. You don't have to walk back and forth. You don't have to walk back and forth and, um, you know, if you need a wrench and you didn't anticipate needing a wrench, boom, it's there. Okay, so that's what we're going to think of these as, is tools in our toolbox. So risk assessment is a tool, hand hygiene is a tool, and personal protective equipment is our other tool. Okay. So risk assessment, I will just diverge for one second. This is a frog, and I know that it's a frog. <laughs> it's a frog because if you go looking for a picture on the internet of somebody who's thinking, most of the pictures look like this. Mm -hmm. And that is really, it's not a headache. Risk assessment really isn't a headache. It's something that we're all pretty good at, and I know that because you're here and you're mostly intact. So the most um, simple risk assessment that we all do, and we don't even really think about it, is crossing the road. What does that have to do with PPE? Well, we'll get there. Go with me for a second. So to cross the road, what do we do? We look both ways. Absolutely. So you look to the left and you look to the right. Why? You say assess the risk. To, make, to assess the risk, that's right, the risk of getting hit by a vehicle, right? So what kinds of things are we thinking about when we're assessing that risk? How close are the cars? How close are the cars? How far away are the cars? How fast are the cars moving, right? Do I have time to walk across? Do I have time to run across? Is running across the road safe? So there are a number of different questions and we, we go through this risk assessment and honestly, at some point it becomes very natural and we even stop really thinking about it. But I know for a fact that it's not something we were born able to do. Someone had to teach us the risk assessment when we were little. And my five-year-old finally has learned the lesson, finally. <laughs> Took a little while, it was a bit iffy, but thankfully she made it through. So the thing is that when we go to cross a road, there are certain questions that we ask ourselves to make sure that it's going to be safe. And in the same way, when we're in a healthcare setting, working with people who might become inpatients at the hospital or may not, depending on how their visit to the setting goes, there are things that we need to be able to think about in order to keep ourselves safe. The first one is, could I be exposed or splashed or sprayed with someone's body fluids? Okay, that's, that's cool. That's an easy question. Yes, no? If the answer is yes, how am I going to prevent that exposure from happening? That's the second question we ask. So it's a two-step kind of a process. Could I be exposed? And if the answer is anything other than no, how am I going to prevent myself from being exposed? So here's a slide about personal protective equipment. You can see the mask with the eye protection that we've talked about already, and gloves. So it would be appropriate to use a mask and eye protection, as we've already mentioned, if you could be splashed or sprayed. Think of that picture with the man and the woman. So that woman could have maybe anticipated that gentleman is not looking very well. He's hacking, he's coughing, maybe he's sneezing as well. Now if I'm going to go and ask him for his health card, then I need to protect myself by putting on a mask with eye protection. Gloves are appropriately worn when you'll have to have contact with some kind of body fluid or visible soil, maybe on someone's belongings, 
and you don't want to get your, your skin visibly soiled. So that's when you'll put on a pair of gloves. The thing about gloves is you want to make sure your hands are clean before you put the gloves on and you're going to clean your hands immediately after using the gloves. And lots of times gloves aren't even necessary. Okay, so we're talking about appropriate use of personal protective equipment, all right? With your risk assessment, that will inform what you're going to use to protect yourself, okay? Hand hygiene is the next topic, and I know you are experts in the field of hand hygiene. I won't belabor the point. Um, just to remind you, the best option for cleaning your hands when your hands are not visibly soiled, so they look clean, but you know you were just in contact with someone and now it's time to clean your hands, the best option is alcohol-based hand rub. It's going to kill whatever bugs are on the surface of your hands. So after your hands are dry, when you've used the hand rub product, all that's left are little germ corpses. And they're not infectious to anyone. That's the good news. Soap and water is a little trickier. There are way more steps and you need your sink and your soap and your paper towels. And uh, of course, if you don't get the steps right, you're going to walk away from that sink with living germs still on your hands. Okay, and that's why hand rub is actually the best. When we wash with soap and water, what we're trying to do is physically scrape the bugs off the surface of our hands and then rinse them down the drain. So if you're hand washing, make sure you do a good job, all right? That's the bottom line. Remember to offer patients an opportunity to clean their hands as well. So when they come into the hospital, whether they've been to West Africa or not, <laughs> offer them an opportunity to clean their hands as is appropriate. Okay. I do a hand with a bottle in that. That's what I do. Sure, great. That's super, because the more we can emphasize to patients, clean hands are well, important. Some people don't want it. Some people don't, and they have the right to refuse, but we have to find a balance, and we want them to know that hand hygiene is very important, um, especially in the hospital. So I'll encourage you to, clean, to keep your hands clean, and I'll encourage you to share uh, an opportunity to clean hands with uh, people coming through the door. A really quick slide, what if, what if something bad happens and you get sprayed? What if you're like the woman in that first picture I showed and that happens to you? Is that a problem? Could be. Could be, absolutely. <coughs> so we could choose to dismiss it and pretend, ah, it's no big deal. We could just shrug it off and go on with our day. We could. But... It could put us at risk for some kind of infection. Influenza, meningitis, it could, you know, I don't wanna fear monger, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and recognizing that, you know, germs happen and people do get sick. And when we know that people are coming through the door and may be sick, we do want to be aware of our own health and well-being and how that might be impacted um, if we're exposed to someone who is sick, okay? So if you have an exposure, like a cough or a splash or a spray of some kind of body fluid into your eyes or nose or mouth or into an open area on your skin, that should be covered up. But if it's not and it gets something in it, that could be a problem for you. So you're going to need to notify a staff person in the area. You're also going to need to notify Jamie or Linda to make sure that appropriate processes can be followed to ensure that you have your health and your safety intact, okay? So this isn't a change to the rules. This is simply an increased awareness of a situation that could put you at risk for an infection from your work here at the hospital. And we certainly wouldn't want to put your health and well-being at risk ever. That's the bottom line. So when something unexpected goes down and you are exposed to somebody else's body fluids, it's not something to shrug off in your role as a volunteer, okay? And I just wanna make you aware of that. And that's it.